And the prophet peace be upon him's message was always that you repel bad with good, that you always respond to evil with good, that you should always remember that God loves justice and never transgress the limits. Imagine what a little bit boy you have to be to, in the middle of a genocide, in the middle of this war, to take time to make videos about little old me because your fragile little ego got hurt because women called you out on your bullshit. So motherfucker, step the fuck down. Go and get a job. Go and do some fucking work. Put your energy in service to the struggle and sound the fuck down. This is the story of feminist Muslim Miriam Francois Sarah and her slow descent into madness. Miriam accepted Islam in 2003 at the age of 21 and was soon featured in many Islamic platforms. From her early days in Islam, it was very clear that she had mixed her Islamic identity with feminist ideologies, but nobody has called her out until now. Miriam Francois Sarah is a 42-year-old French journalist who's done some good works for the Palestine cause. And also, she I remember watching some of the things that she used to do on something called Big Questions, which is a program that used to come over Sunday in the UK. And she was one of the main protagonists, in fact, advocating the pro-Islamic position, you know, clarifying some of the misconceptions about Islam. Very articulate, very good. And unfortunately, I don't know what's happened. One of my friends sent me a lecture of hers where she delivered and she delineated her positionality, if you want to call it that, both theologically and ideologically. I want to leave you with one clip and then come back and respond to it in kind. Defensive posturing about the great gains Islam brought for women in the 7th century says nothing about whether or not it continues to be a force for good in the advancing of women's rights today. This first clip here, she is questioning whether or not Islam is a force of good in the modern world. Now someone may make a plethora of different excuses for her and say that she was just doing this. Maybe I'm misinterpreting what she means by Islam. Maybe she means it in a civilizational sense. Maybe she means it in some other sense. Okay, no problem. Let's look at the second clip. And high profile cases of sexual slavery from India to here in Europe are sadly far too common. But surely the question shouldn't be whether Islam is uniquely oppressive towards women, but more so why it isn't providing the liberating principles which were so critical to the Prophet peace be upon him's early message. Moving to textual Islam itself, there are undoubtedly verses and sayings of the Prophet peace be upon him, which continue to cause concern in their current understanding. The juristic and exegesis-based heritage is in many ways deeply patriarchal and at times undeniably misogynistic. So here she is talking about hadith and she's questioning whether or not they're misogynistic and she is actually saying that they are undeniably misogynistic. Now, once again, if I were to go in the street now and ask people whether or not they would think that a Muslim could say this, I think that they would say no. If I were to put the words of Marianne Francois Serra to people in the streets, they would say this is likely said, or these words are likely said by some anti-Islamic proponent. Someone may say, okay, well, maybe she meant that, maybe she meant this. Let's take a look at the third clip. How can we claim misogyny is not an issue when so-called moderate interpretations claim that verse 434 allows a man to physically admonish his wife using a miswork or, if he's super modern, a plastic toothbrush. How can we accept the underlying power relations which see women treated in an infantilizing and demeaning fashion, smacked like a naughty child by a man assumed to have superior and unquestionable authority over her? We have a problem when the most progressive interpretations continue to argue that this is merely a symbolic gesture. Symbolic? Symbolic of what, we must question? Of power relations which give men the right to treat grown women like petulant children. My feeling generally about religion is that it ought to elevate the soul to higher ethical planes. If we fall back on the all too easy, these are problems found everywhere, the question remains of what exactly Islam is contributing to improving women's lot, rather than adding its own layer of culturally or religiously specific justifications for these injustices. So here, she's talking about a verse in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 34, and she's quoting a progressive interpretation 
she, in her words, and she's rejecting this progressive interpretation. Now, my question would be then, if you're rejecting the most progressive interpretation of 434, what interpretation do you accept? Do you accept any interpretation? Because the answer to this question implicates you as either a Muslim or a non-Muslim. If that's your position, then the question is, how is it the case that you still identify as a Muslim? I mean, this would be the question I then ask. Because Islam is you believe in every single word of the Quran. You believe in every single instruction given by the Prophet. This is what Islam is. But it gets worse, actually, because as I was listening to these kufri statements and statements of disbelief and statements of deviance and all this kind of things, and I was feeling sorry for her and actually feeling a great deal of disappointment actually, there was something else that I realized that she was actually making blunders about the Islamic tradition. Let's look at the fourth clip and take a look at what we're talking about. Taoist teachings regard pregnant women as models of meditation because of the recognition of the superhuman levels of concentration and transcendence required in labor. Women are quite literally masters of meditation to be studied and learned from. All I could find in Islamic sources was some advice about eating dates. It's sad and telling that pregnancy and childbirth and child rearing are not afforded the preeminence in our scholastic manuals that they ought to, but just viewed legalistically through the dry prism of juristic formalities. She's comparing Islam with Taoism, okay? And she's saying that when you look at the Taoist tradition, you see that the pregnant woman, for example, she's being described in this way, which is she has superhuman meditative capabilities. And Comparing that with what she found in Islam, all she could find is a few scraps here and there about women taking dates when she's pregnant. Now, this is a ridiculous thing. Now, to my knowledge, she does not have access to the Arabic language, number one. But I will say to you, you don't even need access to the Arabic language. There are hadiths of an eschatological nature, of a spiritual nature. For example, the hadith of a very famous one. If a pregnant woman dies giving birth, then she dies a shaheed, she dies a martyr. I don't think the Taoist tradition or the Christian tradition or the Jewish tradition or any other tradition actually has a hadith this explicit and this respecting of the woman's position as a pregnant woman, exactly the category that you have spoken about. Of all things you could have mentioned, you mentioned the thing which Islam puts so much stress on and gives so much to respect to women on. And I could speak for hours about this, actually. But it shows, with all due respect, your ignorance on the matter. So, for example, in chapter number 46 of the Quran, uh, Allah mentions about the mother, that the woman, when she's pregnant, she's doing so in a state of difficulty. And when she's giving birth, she's doing so in a state of difficulty. There is commemoration, there is recognition of the woman's position as a pregnant woman, okay? In the Quran, I would argue more than any other ancient religious text, okay? For you to, to make a mockery out of yourself, not even the Islamic tradition, by misrepresenting the Islamic tradition and saying that well, all I could find was a few things here about the dates and this and that, Sorry, it shows your ignorance on this topic. So this is a message to this foul-mouthed, French toast, feminist woman who is calling us thou guys F-boys. Yes, have some shame, okay? We don't need your French values, your Western French toast values to come into Islam and try to dilute it. And you've been a Muslim for 20 years and making all these theological mistakes, attacking subsections of Muslim society, using colonial narratives, huh? using liberal and feministic narratives, which are knowledge productions of the West. Now you're imposing them on us. You want Islam to fit in line with that, that model and you're attacking subsections. Why is it that you can say that? Unchecked and unaccounted. And if we say anything, oh, but she's a pro-Palestine activist. What do you mean? What do you mean that she's a pro-Palestine activist? She can see what she wants. She was lecturing for the Dean Institute, which is her ex-husband, Adam Dean, who used to be part of Quilliam, who was colleagues or connected with Tommy Robinson. She was part of a ecosystem of anti-Islamic propaganda. If you're part of that ecosystem now, yeah, and you're disseminating this kind of falsehood, theological deviance, with all due respect, it doesn't matter if you're wherever you're from, whatever country you're from, whatever gender you are, if you as a feminist, I'm not even going to judge you by Islam now, I'm going to judge you on feminism, if you as a feminist want equal rights, then prepare to face equal responsibilities. I'm not going to discriminate just because you're a woman, I'm not going to refrain from refuting you just because you're a woman, that would be a disrespect to your feministic sensibilities you will get refuted and repudiated and humiliated even if it needs to be done, okay? If you come out against any members of our society and just because you had that card, I don't know if, if you still identify as a Muslim, as a Muslim, now you can go further than any white feminist could, by the way. A white feminist could not say the things that you're saying without being labeled as an Islamophobe, just to let you know. And you know just because you had membership of that group at one point in time, and once again, I don't know if you still maintain membership there, that you can go further and in the same video you're attacking Mamel Ghazali, you're attacking Khurtubi, you're attacking a Shafi, huge scholars, and you can't even speak, you can't even uh, uh, pronounce 
enunciate the Arabic language properly. And you have the right now, you think, because you've got, you've had some Western education that you can go and attack a whole different tradition with your colonial mentality. No thanks. The Oxford graduate, Dr. Miriam, responded to these accusations in a typical feminist manner, with curses and filth not befitting of any Muslim. Imagine what a little bitch boy you have to be to, in the middle of a genocide, in the middle of this war, to take time to make videos about little old me. Because your fragile little ego got hurt because women called you out on your bullshit. So motherfucker, step the fuck down. Go and get a job. Go and do some fucking work. Put your energy in service to the struggle and sound the fuck down. Miriam continues to evade answering these important questions and continues to post content that goes against Islamic teachings on her social media platforms while shedding all forms of modesty, both in dress and speech. Let this be a lesson for all Muslim women who are impressed by Western feminist ideologies. This is where it leads. Feminism will eventually end your Islam. May Allah guide Miriam and all of us.